Okay, let's uh, go ahead and I'll ask the city manager to introduce our study session for this afternoon. All right, this afternoon, um, our study session is about budget follow-up, and um, this is an opportunity to review the graffiti abatement program. And Police Chief um, Tom Schwethelm will lead that group. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Olivares, members of the council. This afternoon, we're gonna be sharing with you some additional information about our graffiti abatement program. Back in June, I know different members of the council had a variety of different questions about the program, so we want to take this opportunity here, not just from the police department, but also from the other departments who are participating in this effort, that being Recreation, Parks, and Community Service, our Transportation and Public Works Department, and our Neighborhood Revitalization Program. So the City of Santa Rosa, we have our graffiti abatement ordinance, for those of you keeping track, 3729. Um, and what that says, in essence, is that property owners, tenants, and occupy, occupants are responsible for removing the graffiti within 72 hours. And that's a key component, that it really is a community issue, and we need everyone involved in this. So if the graffiti is in on your private property, we're asking, this ordinance asks that they have a responsibility to clean it up. The graffiti removal method must render the vandalism in inconspicuous. It also restricts sales, access, and possession of graffiti tools. It also allows for stricter penalties for graffiti crimes and parental responsibility. So the city has taken a very collaborative response to this. Um, we've learned that a lack of abatement creates visual pollution, becomes a public nuisance. I think everyone here has can probably recite some individual um, incidents that has had an impact on you and different members of the community. We take a very proactive approach to graffiti abatement. Tagging and gang graffiti has escalated, so it too has the city's efforts to eliminate it. While the police department enforces the graffiti ordinance, private property owners are responsible for cleaning graffiti on their property and may obtain assistance from the graffiti abatement volunteers on a limited basis. Transportation and public work crews clean public property, sidewalks, road signs, and roadways. And then recreation and parks crews clean the public parks. And then NRP plays the, the vital communication point in those neighborhoods where they are working to focus on those specific neighborhoods. We put together this little chart to kind of walk you through each process in the event that any of you or a member of the public sees graffiti. So any time an incident of graffiti is observed, we ask everyone to call our graffiti hotline. The number's posted there, 543-3499. So this first process will walk you through if it's on private property. So if it's on private property, that goes to our graffiti abatement program at the police department. From there, they photograph it, and those notices from the ordinance get sent out. We keep track of all those different photographs. That is very beneficial for us when we're able to put enough information together to prosecute vandals who are defacing private property. Our graffiti abatement coordinator follows up on the notices sent, and the non-compliance goes to code enforcement. Now regarding the non-compliance, I know there's been some questions about the significance, how big of impact is that? There's only been one since um, March of 2012 when our current process is in place with the current personnel there. So it's not a heavy workload. It Basically the ordinance in, in my eyes is working. We're getting that voluntary compliance. So same process if it's on public property. You see the graffiti goes to the exact same number. Again, the, the reason we do that, we want to be the filter for that to make the decision about or determination whether it's public or private property. Then if it's on public property, as I mentioned earlier, there's three different options. If it goes to public or transportation and public works or neighborhood revitalization or recreation and parks, different crews go to clean it up. So transportation and public work crews respond to graffiti calls within 24 hours. Recreation and Parks generally responds to graffiti calls within 24 to 72 hours, depending on the staffing and acreage ratio. Parks personnel also photograph all large graffiti in their responsible areas of the city. Some of the other tagging incidents, we don't take the photographs, so if you have like a handrail and someone has etched something in there, it's very small uh, tagging there, we're not capturing all of that. 
then graffiti is reported to the park staff via the graffiti hotline, private citizens, there's a group called the Greenway Guardians and other city department staff and park staff. I wanted to share with council some of the costs of this effort. So nationally, they talk, um, estimates range from seven to $15 billion per year. The city averages more than over a half a million dollars annually, including services, supplies, and personnel costs in our cleanup and abatement efforts. It's important that we do what we're doing here, and again, this community-wide collaboration, because unabated graffiti diminishes the neighborhood's integrity and lowers property values by an estimate 20%. It's very difficult. I would like to be able to tell you the total cost for the private property owners, but that's a very difficult number because if property owners are doing it and clean up right away, we don't always capture the actual cost of that cleanup. So some of the things the police department's doing, currently we have We've got a new community service officer position for the graffiti abatement position. For a variety of different personnel reasons, we're testing and we've identified some folks that may go in that position, but there's a training program involved in that. So we currently have a current field and evidence technician assigned to that position. And what she does, she investigates some of the crimes, educates the community in schools, leads the volunteers, plans and participates in community cleanups, enforces graffiti code, and organizes neighborhood mural projects. Right now, the number of volunteers we have is approximately 43. So we also have in our property crimes team, a graffiti detective who conducts additional investigations to identify and build cases against prolific graffiti vandals. He also prepares search warrants, conducts arrests, and maintains essential graffiti-related data for future prosecutions. And then our volunteers provide the assistance with graffiti eradication, receive free eradication supply kits, much of which are donated. Here's some statistics from the last couple of years. Hotline calls, you can see from uh, 09, we had 420. So far to date, 216. One of the challenges of looking at these numbers, say what does it mean? So we just elected to say this is just the hard data. Some of the times when we have our community outreach and really advertise our abatement efforts, numbers go up. So I'd caution everyone from drawing a direct correlation that either the graffiti situation is improving, getting better or worse, just based on these numbers. Also, the graffiti abatement notices speak for themselves. Um, same thing with number of arrests. I would like to say with our graffiti arrests, one of the things that we have seen when people who engage in this behavior realize that some cities take it serious, I mean, not many other communities have a uh, graffiti detective assigned to it, it tends to prohibit that behavior or they'll go somewhere else to do that because they realize in this community anyway, there are consequences for that. And then one thing that we are hoping once we get the position filled full time, make additional community presentations because as our staffing models have changed, it has been a challenge to keep up with that uh, ongoing schedule. Some additional police department costs, they speak for themselves. So the community service officer was a new classification that we've just added, and we're estimating the detective spends about 10% of his or her time. Again, it's roughly about four hours a week on just graffiti issues. And then those are the numbers that come from the budget for the supplies. Again, that last figure, that $17,000, that's still somewhat uh, up in the air whether or not that's gonna be used because it's a uh, redevelopment agency. That I don't think that answer is complete yet. And for the Recreation and Parks response, I'd invite Tony Lococo to come and talk about their efforts. Mayor Olivares, members of the City Council, my name is Tom Lococo, I'm a supervisor in the Recreation and Parks Department and I will be talking about uh, parks operational approach uh, to graffiti removal. Um, our staff members are actively involved in, in, in graffiti removal just as a, a regular part of our day. It's so prevalent and, and common that now it's, it's just integrated into what we do. We keep supplies obviously in our park sheds, in our vehicles, and I think in most cases we're able to address um, graffiti removal in the community parks that day and in their neighborhood, neighborhood parks uh, within 72 hours. Um, as the chief alluded to, there's a lot of small tags out there that are in obscure, inconspicuous places that we don't even see, and, and most of the time those have to be brought to our attention because we don't always get over to see them. Um, I'm afraid to touch this thing, and I'm not sure which button <laughs> advances me. So. That's long skinny. Okay. Oh, that one? Yeah. The, lo the logical one. Thank you, chief. Um, 
the time spent on removing graffiti is uh, is dependent upon the extent and location of the damage. Uh, this picture that we're looking at here is, is, is Finley Park. Um, our view is with our back to the community center. All four walls of that building got hit um, that afternoon, or I'm, I'm sorry, it was that, it was one evening. Uh, it was between nine at night and six in the morning and we know that because the bathrooms are locked at, during those hours and there was no graffiti inside the stalls. Um, some uh, an associated shed, adjacent shed and couple tags on the, commun on the community center were also had. Uh, it took us eight hours to repaint the buildings, the doors, clean the graffiti off the tile and some other surfaces. Um, with respect to Art Start, we, we, we do give um, them as much assistance as we can, um, make them aware that there's been some damage done to one of their art projects, whether it's a bench, um, murals certainly down on the Greenway have, have, been, have been an issue or a target lately. Uh, what we try not to do is, is uh, paint over their artwork. Um, we'll paint around it and that sort of thing to get rid of, get rid of uh, the graffiti, but we defer to them and I hate to have an overzealous paint roller um, do some damage. Um, let's see. Can I back this one up? <laughs> I apologize for that. No, oh, be that. Okay. All right. okay, I'll let you. And I promised Tom I would talk about our budget for him. So we estimate that Recreation and Parks spends about $145,000 a year on graffiti removal, and that is a portion of our parks um, salaries. As Tom mentioned, all park staff who are out in the field are actively uh, removing graffiti. We also uh, use the city's soda blasting contract when we have graffiti on surfaces that we cannot use paint on. So if there's concrete elements or other features um, that cannot be treated with paint, we do call on the soda blaster. Uh, various supplies, like Tom mentioned with the, the bathroom photo, um, we use graffiti remover and, and other materials to, to treat the uh, surfaces. We also have a park vandalism account that is used for various forms of vandalism that occur throughout the parks. Um, and oftentimes it is graffiti that prompts us to replace certain elements, whether that be features in bathroom stalls or um, other exterior elements in the parks. And then finally, as Tom mentioned, we have um, a portion of our public art account that we use to repair the art star elements. So if they are damaged to benches, um, the fish statue in Prince Gateway Park has been damaged several times and we need to have the artists come in and prepare their new uh, tiles or um, help us address the damage to the, to the features. Now I'm gonna turn it over to Rick Mosier. So some of you may remember up till about three years ago, uh, the graffiti abatement for the Public Works Department was done by a contractor. We started, we took that work in-house about three years ago. That's worked out really well. We're keeping up with the abatement uh, very well, 24 hours, and it allows us on uh, rainy days and times when there isn't much graffiti, we can recoup those uh, staff people and have them uh, working on other important things. So uh, that's something we're, uh, enjoying. Um, let's see, the garbage hauling contract also um, calls for a $50,000 contribution to graffiti abatement. Public Works uses 30,000 of that. Uh, 20,000 is available for other abatement um, by other departments or us together. So uh, we can use that for things like if somebody really goes on a bombing run and just really goes on a tear and ruins either a park or a, or a street, uh, then we can tap into that extra. So we only use 30 for ongoing average annual stuff. Graffiti abatement is currently performed entirely by two in-house staff. Um, and as I said, it's been working very well. It's abated on public property only, so we only concentrate on, and we, but we see plenty of it, on the streets, on uh, bridges, and we see, especially see it uh, on the things like this picture here, on our electrical boxes, those just get ho hit over and over again, but we get right after them really quickly. <clears throat> this is the budget, $282,000 a year. Um, this shows how it's broken down.
then in the interest of us not uh, shuffling people up here for you too much, I'll cover the neighborhood revitalization program slide for Dave Gouin. Dave Gouin's in the audience, so if you have any questions for him. But uh, the NRP program holds property owners accountable to the abate their graffiti and coordinates mural projects uh, in the focus neighborhoods. With that, I'll turn it back to uh, the chief. One of the things we really wanted to share, um, after the council meeting, actually during the time, we actually, all the four different departments got together to talk about is this the best methodology for bait and graffiti. Um, the program got off to such a, a strong start a couple years ago when we had Georgia Pedgriff in that position. She really took it to this highest level and we we're really actually hoping to take it to that next level once we get that person in that position. But we're of the belief that the current model that you just saw here was an effective way of abating the graffiti throughout this community. Some of the other things that we have done that I'm sure many of you are aware of that not every other community does is some of the mural projects that we've done through all parts of town. Here's some photos from Dutton Avenue and Newhall mur murals. We also do a lot of different presentations and different events. Again, across the board to try to educate the public of the importance of cleaning it up as quickly as it appears. These are a variety of the different events that we've gone to. So with that, I'd ask if you have any questions from any of the departments that are participating in this process, we're more than happy to answer any of those questions. Thank you, Chief. Questions? Councilmember Member Vastapray. Thank you very much, all of you, for your service. It's really above and beyond a job, I know that. Um, and, and Georgia, you definitely are a very difficult, challenging uh, person and uh, to even try to come up to the level at which people in our community became very used to calling upon you and whatever, so thank you all. You can see it takes a team to try to replace all the good work that you did. Um, I'm wondering, when we saw the slide um, at Finley, um, are there surveillance cameras there that ended up catching anybody? or? Sounds like no, there was not. Really? Um, and so I'm sure you've looked into um, putting surveillance cameras there and that's a tremendous expenditure or Karen Weeks is such a go-to person for grants. Okay, is there a grant out there? That's more of a recreation and parks in? question. Let's. Okay. Yeah, I'll go ahead and I'll take that. Okay. Yeah, we've, we've uh, explored the use of cameras. It, the expense of those things is just really hits our department pretty hard, so. Um, I, I think possibly that might be a location now that the senior wing's there, it's a little exactly. bit closer to that bathroom building, it might be right. more practical now. Right, right, that, that's what I'm thinking. And I've evidently misidentified all of the go-to people in your police department for grants, but I, I'm sure that you're, you're all looking at that. One of the challenges that we've experienced with our downtown camera project, any time a municipality actually records something, you need to keep that data. And that's a tremendous amount of data. Okay, how are you going to keep it? How long do you have to keep it? And that just adds to different costs. So it totally is a cost-benefit analysis. And if there are grants available for that particular need, I know definitely Mark Richards and I would be more than happy to entertain that. Haven't okay. seen them run across our desk yet, though. Okay. Um, and then I know from being a counselor at Santa Rosa Junior High, um, many times um, the staff, uh, the art teacher, I mean, uh, so many people on staff, uh, I'm sure you're still working closely with, with the schools on this. And I know one of my former counselees was one of your main people, and he had to work off, um, you know, his, uh, his time on cleaning up. I think he very definitely learned his lesson. I think that you've used him uh, as someone to talk with uh, the present day uh, graffiti people. But um, I know that from yesterday's meeting, Art in Public Places, that we talked about um, with the new art that's in, you know, city-owned property. I'm thinking of the Fish property on Benton and North. Um, when the monarch butterfly uh, went up and people were very concerned that it might be attacked with graffiti. They have a new covering, which I don't know how many members of the public, but I know that businesses that have contacted me about how it's a, an expenditure for them to expunge those marks, that, that um, it is locally now an affixative of some nature that makes it more graffiti proof. So I'm wondering, will that help us at all as far as curbing some of these, um, you know, things that are so disturbing to the public? 
Yeah, I think, you know, I don't know the exact technology, but I know a lot of different uh, buildings going up have, okay, how do we avoid the graffiti or make it right. much more challenging to do that? Right. So I think all those efforts help contribute to ridding this from the community. Right, thank you. Councilmember McGorn. Thanks, uh, everybody. Uh, it, it is great to have an explanation now about the, the multi-prong effort to uh, abate the graffiti. Uh, and I know we waited a long time uh, to hire the community services officer. Do we have an officer hired yet? I don't see him or her in the So audience. we have the funding for the position, but with the organization structure, we have an in-house people who have been selected for that position, but they're occupying positions that we need to hire behind because we're, we're, it's a, when we have a, um, a loss of that position, we're faced with do we close the police front counter to members of the public so that we can fill this position, or do we leave that open, try to get them trained to fill that spot? So it's a cut and paste until we have all the personnel. So yes, we have the funding via Measure O, but we can't release the employees who've been selected for that classification until we train the records technicians there so we can keep the front door open for members of the public. And I could appreciate that. I, I know this has been ongoing for a number of months um, doing the do, -si do Do we anticipate that this person will be in this position anytime soon? Define soon. Because it is a classification. Um, because we do not have all the positions new to the city. I just did an interview of one police tech yesterday. We still have one more vacancy, so it depends upon the candidate pool. So I'm real hesitant to say by this date we will do it. Okay. I will tell you our current field evidence technician who's doing a fabulous job that she will remain in that position until we do find the replacement. So the vehicle abatement position will not be vacant. Just the, the community service officer will not be there for a little bit. Great. It's, it's uh, obviously a little frustrating for the community and I guess for me as a council member because we know that this is an issue. You've demonstrated how much it impacts our community and, and I also know that you are trying to make this happen as quickly as you can, but it would be great to uh, speed this up and identify this person and hire this person and get this person up and, and running. Also, I think it would be really helpful for um, the community to know about the responses and this perhaps this PowerPoint presentation or abbreviated version uh, on our website. If it happens on public property, here's what you do and here's the person, here's the process that we would use to do it. Here, if it happens on city property uh, or private property, this is the response, and I haven't looked at the website and to know whether or not it's yeah. on there. Well, well, just two things, just so everyone's clear, there, the function of graffiti abatement is currently being done. There'll be no right. losing of that, whether we have a classification of a community service officer or a field evidence technician, the community, it's, it'll be transparent. You'll not see something different when the CSO comes in, they're just a different person. In regards to the, um, the, how do you differentiate between public and private, that's why we have one number. Just call the graffiti hotline. We make the assessment if it's public or private, and it goes there. So I'll make sure that that is on both our Facebook page and our website so that information is readily available. I believe it's there. I just As you probably know, I bend over backwards to give information to the public. I think it's really important that the public knows how much this is costing the city alone and uh, let alone, I'm not sure uh, how we can estimate how much it's costing the community. Because exactly. All of the volunteers and all of the businesses are cleaning up the graffiti, and it's annoying. And the final question is, I know George has spent a lot of time trying to document the graffiti and identify the tagger and do the prosecutions. Are we still working? That's why the detective is here. And do we have any kind of success rate or anecdotal or statistics that would let un us know about whether or not this effort is being effective? Other than with the statistics that we've already shared here, the, again, the process is the same, whether it was Georgia, Janice, or our soon-to-be CSO. Uh -huh. That's why we have a detective assigned to it. Uh -huh. So they do document with all the photographs. They archive all those photographs. So when they get information, and I think uh, you were talking about the um, school resource officers, they're a valuable uh, participant in this graffiti baby program because a lot of time with the tagging, we'll go there, especially around one high school, who might you know be here? And because of the relationships our SROs have on campus, that's been very helpful in trying to identify some of those responsible for the graffiti around the schools. Well, the statistics here actually are somewhat encouraging in that the number of incidents are declining 
and the graffiti arrests are declining, and I hope that that is reflective of the number of incidents for sure. So that's very helpful. Um, but I, you know, obviously we still have a need. And one of the big challenges too, just f for your edification, when it comes to gang graffiti, a lot of that is not a moniker, it's one gang or the other. So it's very difficult to prosecute those cases. I've even shared with some community members, they think, well, if, if you get a spray can with a fingerprint, can you prosecute that? Not necessarily, because they, how can you prove that that person did the graffiti? So although it seems like you should be, well, can't you figure out who did that? Well, when you're speaking again for a specific gang, it's one person we can't arrest everyone for. So that's really a challenge, but by the way we're documenting it and archiving it, we'll go be able to go back and find some of those similarities. And do we have uh, instances in other cities where they have been successful in diverting the taggers into uh, restorative justice kind of programs or teen court kind of a program so that they will turn their artistic ability to some good? I know we've hosted a couple of those graffiti um, conferences here where they can share some of those ideas. So I can't tell you specifically yeah, in this town they're doing this, but it's very much um, what we're looking in towards some of the um, evidence-based practices that we're doing, both with our realignment efforts and some of our gain prevention measures. So it's the same thing that we are sharing with some of our local communities, what works for you and what's not. And we're sharing what's working for us. And that's, that's the nice part about why people come to Santa Rosa to find out what we're doing because of the success and the collaboration we have just even among city departments. So perhaps that is part of our new um, gang task force strategic plan to look at uh, alternative ways of dealing with these kind of things, e even with the gangs. Glad okay. to hear it. Thanks. Other questions? Councilmember Wyslock. <laughs> Thanks, Tom, for the presentation. We appreciate it. Uh, you made a statement that tagging and graffiti have escalated. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Could you put it in context? What do you? At the very beginning, you had said it's it's going up. I just I it's not a specific year to year. In other words, it's not going away. We're still seeing incidents of, of tagging. And again, one of that I, I think Tom had mentioned. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the bombing comment, where someone comes in and they just bomb a whole neighborhood. So maybe one person, but responsible for so many, you know, hundreds of incidents. That's a very difficult thing to measure. So is it the number of taggers, the number of tagging incidents? So sure, my no, intent by saying that was just, it's not going away, we're staying on this because we're not seeing a huge reduction where we don't need any of the department's participation that we talked about today. And is the, the statistics here, did we start keeping them in April of 2009? Is that the earliest we have? To put it in perspective, I think we just started with 2009. We had data going back further but for the purpose of this presentation, this is just kind of a window, a snapshot of can where we, we've been. Can, I, can we get the data that goes back further? If you can tell me specifically what data you would well, like. Just match it up with Measure O, that'd be fine. Just the ones that's presented here. So Tagging it. I mean, if, if we have data uh, on hotline calls or graffiti abatement notices sent, earlier graffiti arrests, earlier, if we have that. Okay. I, that, that's what I would like. Those same categories that we have sure. on this? Sure, okay. unless, I mean, I would assume that there's no, I'm, that, that's fine for me, I don't, I, you're, you're the expert and I appreciate it. Um, yeah, and I, I can understand, I can appreciate that it is hard to, to put them in categories because you don't know if it's one or 100. I get all that. I have a quick question uh, for Mr. Mosier on his costs. Are these all staff salaries? Uh, and it's just basically a portion of the time. That's uh, that's most of it, but there's there's materials also, and there's uh, a vehicle in there. Uh, that's most of it. Okay. Well, okay. That's it. Thank you very much. Other questions? Councilman Vostoprich. Um, yes, referring back to the uh, meeting yesterday, art and public places. I, I'm not sure where we are on the agreement, and I know that it's become legally um, challenging, and I haven't I talked with our city attorney before this about that, but that is um, the mentioning of the Prince Memorial Greenway. And um, the contract many years ago that was with Norm Rosenblatt um, as a developer, and David uh, Gwine, I'm sure, is familiar with many of the concerns. Um, and so I, I, my understanding from Martin Public Places is that it's not really clear cut. Uh, I, I would like to have more information on 
um, what was at one time considered to be eyes on the creek, eyes on the Prince Memorial Greenway, and that the Hyatt, um, you know, with the beautiful art and public places um, works there, um, that they lock that door. They don't want their guests going out after a certain time, and I heard that it's locked 24-7. And I would like to see, since there there is public money involved, I would like to see an update, maybe a future agenda item or a study session as to how the Hyatt is working with our police department, with public works, with recreation and parks on um, the openness, the access, because it's statistically proven that the more eyes, uh, the more visibility of uh, people walking, um, uh, bicycling on Prince Memorial Greenway, the less vandalism. So I, I would really like to have that looked at as far as the relationship vis-a-vis -vis Hyatt and uh, the Prince Memorial uh, Greenway vandalization. Thank you. Thank you. So I, mean, I would make assumptions that you do work with the merchants and others as far as uh, 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 new prevention efforts and, and sharing information. Um, and I, I would assume that would include the Hyatt and anybody along the Greenway. Absolutely. They're part of our downtown beat. Okay. And our downtown enforcement team works very closely with them. Thank you. Well, th thank you, Chief. Uh, Rick, thank you. Tom, thank you. Staff. Uh, um, Georgia, you're a legend. Okay, you're a legend. And, and, and I think you knew that already. But I think what is really clear here is that, and the chief talked about this, it is a, you know, graffiti is a, a community issue. We have the hotline. Uh, when Georgia left to her new assignment, graffiti abatement did not stop. And I think that's clear from what your presentation is about today, that it continues on. We have somebody in a position at the police department working on that. Uh, yes, hopefully someday we'll have that position uh, back permanently, which would be a good thing for all of us, but I think it's important for the community to understand that they play an important role, and that is write that uh, number down, put it in your phone, in your, in your speed dial, whatever, but uh, the, I, again, the sooner that we call those uh, incidents in, the sooner they get addressed, and I think, yeah, you're right, uh, Council Member Gorin, if, if on the website, just very basically shows what happens when you call, so that people know that something does happen. Your call comes in, it's triaged, if you will, to decide which department it goes to for cleanup, but that does happen, and that we have been continuing with our, our graffiti efforts all along. So, the Chief, thank you, and, and the rest of your staff, thank you very much. Thank you. And I also think it's important to put on the website uh, the statistics that we have, uh, whether it's an increase or a decrease, looks like a de decrease, yeah and at the cost of public property. I think it's really important that our community understands that there is a cost both to private par property owners and to our stretched government services. Yeah, there is a lot more on our website than what you were just shown today, and so we gotta invite members of the public to visit it, and we'll try to get some of the statistics as mentioned today. Great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chief. Okay, let's uh, move on to our regular uh, council meeting. We'll begin with the announcement of the roll call, please. Let the record. Let the record show that all council members are present with the exception of council members Ours and Bartley. Thank you, we'll have a report on our uh, closed session. Thank you, Mayor. The council conferred with legal counsel regarding one existing litigation as identified in the agenda. There is no action to report from that closed session. The council also met in closed session regarding one public employee performance evaluation for the city attorney. There is no action to report from that closed session. Thank you. City Manager, report on our study session, please. The city council conducted a study session um, to review the status of the graffiti abatement program, and no um, action was necessary on that. Thank you very much. We do have a couple of uh, proclamations to present today. And Speaking of legends, John Lowry, come on down here, please. John Lowry, as you know, has been the director of uh, Burbank Housing since 1998. Uh, he's uh, now retired, officially retired now, right, John? Yes, yes. I, think, I think more or less. Yeah. So I, I do want to uh, actually read this proclamation on your retirement because it does uh, uh, note some uh, important things from your time working here in our community. Whereas John Lowry has served as Burbank Housing's Executive Director since 1998, he joined Burbank as its first project manager in 1984 after working as a carpenter and teacher 
And whereas John's Community Service includes California Coalition for Rural Housing and the Home Builders Association of Northern California. He has also served on the Board of Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California and whereas he holds a general contractor's license and BA and MA degrees with majors in economics, politics, and history, and whereas John's awards include Sonoma County Housing Coalition Lifetime Achievement Award, Nonprofit Housing Association of Northern California Inspirational Nonprofit Leader Award, the Santa Rosa Chamber of Commerce Leadership, Santa Rosa Leadership Excellence in the Field of Planning and Development, and Sonoma County Housing Coalition Housing Hero Award, and whereas Burbank Housing has served over 30 various, uh, uh, has received over 30 various commendations under John's leadership from 1998 to today, including various city and county awards, proclamations, and resolutions. And whereas John has worked tirelessly for the betterment of Santa Rosa and Sonoma County for 28 years, and under his leadership, Burbank Housing completed 1,120 apartments and 98 ownership homes in Santa Rosa. Now, therefore, be it resolved that I, Ernesto Oliveras, Mayor of the City of Santa Rosa, do hereby honor and congratulate John Lowry upon his retirement. We wish him well and thank, and thank him for his years of service. John, thank you. Thank you very much uh, for all the work that you've done for our community in, in areas of housing, affordable housing. Uh, your leadership has been tremendous. I know the entire council appreciates what you have done. The entire community appreciates what, what you have done in the area of affordable housing. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mayor Olivares. Um, as, as you know, Burbank has worked, uh, always worked closely with, with the local governments and, and our, our work with the city of Santa Rosa has been uh, uh, a major part of what we do. Uh, I think we've had a very good relationship uh, and we, we certainly intend for that to, uh, to continue. So we, I'm just gonna take just a brief moment. I'd like to introduce uh, Chuck Cornell. Chuck, can you come down? Chuck is the new executive director of, uh, of Burbank Housing, but he's no stranger to Burbank Housing, nor to, nor to the city of uh, Santa Rosa. He's been uh, Burbank's uh, CFO uh, since uh, 1996. I say he had a year off for good behavior. He went to live in Australia for a while, but he came back. Uh, and uh, he, he's, he's very knowledgeable about what we do, knowledgeable about our relationship with the city, uh, and confident that Burbank's relationship with Santa Rosa will continue into the future. Thank you. Uh, thank, thank you very much. And, Go ahead. And may I, whoops. And may I give you my personal um, congratulations for job well done, and thank you for your patience. You've um, served during a number of council tenures, and you've been very patient with all of us and helping us understand some of the challenges of constructing and building affordable housing and allowing us to celebrate when each of the housing projects is opened and talk with so many very grateful residents that have a safe, uh, very wonderful place to live with community rooms and community services. The model is excellent, and we have a number of residents who are so grateful to what you have done over the years, and I, too, am grateful for that. Thanks, John. Well, thank you very much. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Mardell, come on down. We're going to have a proclamation here for National Disability Awareness Month. And uh, Councilmember Gorin will present this. Well, we have a new way of doing things, so I don't get to read all the words, but um, I thank you. I want to take this opportunity to publicly thank you. Most people don't know Mardell and the hard work that she puts in into the city to make sure that we're, our employees are safe and our community is safe. And it, it is in, an important job right now where you really work with the uh, community at large to recognize and, and um, make us aware of some of the challenges of our disabled communities. So why don't you let us know what you're doing? Well, I'm actually gonna let you know what the city is doing. 
um, because the city is participating in quite a few events this month. Um, the first one is today, doing the declaration to honor uh, Disability Awareness Month. Uh, the next thing that we're doing is um, the Did It Anyway art exhibit, which is a joint venture be between Becoming Independent and Disability Services and Legal Center. And uh, Mayor Oliveras will actually be doing the welcoming at that art exhibit. It, it will be at the um, Gallery of Sea and Heaven, which is right over by Juilliard Park. Uh, that is on October 13th, uh, and it is from 5 to 7, and I encourage everyone to, to come and have a glass of wine and, and look at the, uh, the great exhibit. Anyone who wants information can contact me. Uh, on October 17th, it's at 7.30 in the morning, we will have the ninth annual Sonoma County Mayor's Committee on the Employment of People with Disabilities. And this is going to be our biggest event ever. We have mayors from almost every city in Sonoma County who will be coming and presenting awards. We have 10 awards that we're giving, and we're giving one um, Outstanding Achievement Award, which is a secret, or I would tell you who's winning. So if you want to know, you have to come to that breakfast. And we do have a uh, mayor and council member Vas Dupree making presentations at the breakfast. Um, on the 16th, I will be presenting to city council an ADA amendment to our transition plan to address those issues that came out of the um, ADA Amendment Act of 2010. And finally, we will be participating on, um, I've lost my date here, October 19th um, at the fairgrounds in DSLC's Tech Expo, which is a great um, exhibit of all kinds of different uh, equipment that's available to people with disabilities. And it's um, especially beneficial for people with new disabilities on now how do they get around, where can they find services. So it'll be a really great event, and I welcome all of you to attend that at the fairgrounds. And thank you very much for giving this rec recognition to our community. And um, also, I wanted to recognize that we have one of our um, citizens who's been very active in our transition planning, Tim O'Leary, in the audience. And he has been requesting closed captioning for council members, for council meetings, and today has been able to sit and enjoy the meeting and hear what's going on. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mardell. Thank you, Mardell. October is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. I'd like to ask uh, Madeline Keegan, and I think we have a couple detectives coming down as well. Yes, no? Is Madeline here? There she is. There she is. Okay, you're going solo? Just, you, want to, you can invite some guests on if you wish, it's up to you. But uh, it's, uh, Domestic Violence Pre uh, Prevention and Awareness Month again, um, and again, this is something that every community deals with. Uh, here in our community, we've had the YWCA for many, many years, going back to in the mid-70s, I believe. 75. So tell us uh, what, what our plans are for this month and continuing to raise awareness for this uh, issue. Oh my gosh, well, all around Sonoma County, you're gonna see a number of signs that we put it very simply, ending domestic violence in Sonoma County and that this affects one in every four families. And uh, we have a fundraiser at Lagunitas on the 23rd, uh, Tuesday the 23rd, uh, that we're looking forward to reaching a new population of folks around the efforts of the YWCA. We're putting the final touches on a special insert section for the North Bay Business Journal. It will also appear in selected zip codes of the Press Democrat. And we've partnered with the YMCA because uh, you may be surprised to learn that Sometimes I pick up the phone and they wonder if I'm with the YMCA, but we're with the YWCA. So um, I appreciate the opportunity to just make a few comments with you tonight. I just wanna thank you sincerely, all of you, um, for honoring uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month by your proclamation. Uh, by doing that, you not only inspire other people to take notice of the fact that it is one in four families that deal with this issue, but more importantly, you val validate the opportunity for the healing to begin. And as uh, the mayor mentioned, since 1975, a dedicated group of 
women and men have made it their purpose to shelter, encourage, and believe in families that are willing to risk everything they have and everything they know to make a better life for themselves, for their children. And the thing that's very important for everyone to recognize is that these are local families. This is in our community. They are our neighbors, our coworkers, and our friends. And they struggle behind closed doors with the effects of these severely uh, unhealthy relationships. I'm proud to tell you that the YWCA operates the county's only shelter for women and children who flee domestic violence. And we're also very pleased to tell you that of the women who complete our eight-week program followed with up to two years of counseling and support, only 10% of these women go back to those former relationships. And uh, we like to look at that as a 90% success rate. And uh, we're very proud of that. You may know of our 24-hour hotline. That number is 546-1234. And I repeat it often uh, to folks, it's been surprising to me in my career with the Y that so many friends and coworkers and family members have come to me to say that they're aware of a domestic issue and what do they do to reach out for help. So that phone number fields 3,000 calls every year, uh, which is a tremendous amount. We man it 24 hours a day and um, we answer it in the middle of the night, I guarantee it. And uh, from those 3,000 calls, 5,000 referrals have been made to help families do safety planning and seek the necessary support that they need. So we believe that in addition to the basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter, that people deserve respect, dignity, and safety to conduct a productive life. And essentially, families leave their children with us, they trust us, and they leave their lives to create some healing. So again, our sincere appreciation to you for honoring Domestic Violence Awareness Month. Thank you, Madeline. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mark, are you here? Where's Mark? There you go. Mark, we have uh, Fire Prevention Week coming up, and uh, Vice Mayor Sawyer is going to present this proclamation. Thanks, Mark. You know, like many tragedies or accidents, whether it be an auto accident or some kind of break-in or, or fire, uh, it really helps to be prepared and know what to do to maybe prevent some of these things. And uh, as much as we try to get the message across, uh, there are, we never can hear that message often enough. So I'd uh, like to know, can you give us a few words on what's happening uh, in, in, in your efforts to help people deal with prevention of fire and therefore saving lives? We just had one over the weekend. Uh, luckily, I don't believe there was any human life lost, uh, but and I don't quite know yet what the, what the outcome was of that investigation, but oftentimes it's the simplest of things that create these fires. So what's happening? Well, thank you for joining us to recognize uh, Fire Prevention Week. And uh, simple things folks can do. This year's theme is practice two ways out to identify your escape plan in your own home. Practice that plan, practice it with your family, see how it works, have two ways. The second thing is to have an operable smoke detector. Makes a huge difference. There was a fire overnight in Vallejo. A father and son were alerted by the smoke detector and escaped a three alarm fire in their own home. We've proven that it's a very successful way, an inexpensive way to ensure your family's safety. Um, this week and next week, we'll be uh, doing several activities to be, have the community be aware of Fire Prevention Week and to have them become involved with us on a couple activities. And I'm going to introduce our new community outreach specialist, Sharon Carlin, who'll talk about a few of those things coming up. Hi, thank you for acknowledging the Fire Prevention Week 2002. Uh, at Santa Rosa Fire Department, we, we use two forms of public reach out, and that is at our um, sixth annual Community Safety Fair, which will be held on Saturday the 6th this weekend. And that'll be at the Training Tower on West College. It's from 10 to 3. And then also tomorrow, we'll be announcing the third grade winner of the Fire Chief for a Day contest. And there will be 18 winners this year, and they'll be participating in some fire and safety lessons with the firefighters. 
as well as getting to squirt some hose and have some lunch. It's a great day, but I invite everyone here at City Council, the mayor and everyone sitting in the audience and anybody who's listening to please come out and join us for Saturday. It'll be from 10 to 3, and it's a lot of fun. Thank you. Great, thank you. Well, let's just hope that many people don't suffer from the it's not going to happen to me syndrome. So get out there. That's what everybody fires. says. Yeah, exactly. May I just say, well, um, Vice Mayor Sawyer is uh, going there. It's a lot of fun, but it really gives appreciation, I think, all of us who've participated in this for what the firefighters go through every day. I mean, being ready to respond to the call, the equipment that you have to put on in the hottest of days is, my goodness, I, I don't think I'd call it fun to wear, but it is absolutely essential to saving the lives of our firefighters. But what you go through every day is incredible, and we appreciate feeling safe because of your service. And I know as a, a grandmother, that is such a highlight when they can visit uh, the fire station that is close to them. I mean, it really is also a, a fabulous educational opportunity. They really get it. I mean, many of them really get it, you know. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's move on to um, the approval of minutes for September the 18th. Any corrections? Those minutes are approved. We'll move on to mayors and council members' reports. Any statements of abstention for this evening? We have none. Mayors and council members' reports. Uh, I'll be very brief. The Green Music Center, go. It's a great place. I was there on Sunday. Fantastic show. You gotta check it out at some point. Uh, Mr. Waisaki. Yeah, I'll second that. The Green Music Center is fantastic. My wife and daughter were there and uh, enjoyed it immensely. Uh, There's a little bike ride in town on Saturday. And uh, even if you don't ride long distance, what I would suggest you do next year, because the best part of the ride is 7 a.m. in the morning when there's more bikes than cars on the road. And the closer you get to Finley, the more bikes there are. It's like the beginning of a Disney movie. And it's just, it's just a lot of fun. So. Uh, always a pleasure to see everyone out there supporting it, and, and it is raising money for very good causes. Uh, Sunday morning, 6.30 a.m., there will be a harvest run at the YMCA over on college, so another uh, athletic event for a good cause. Thursday, I believe, walk and roll to school happens, uh, so be aware that there'll be more children out there than perhaps normal. Maybe we will make it normal. And then uh, I would also like to ask, uh, I heard at a political event yesterday that there's a thousand jobs that were created. I'd like to see if the report can be shared with the council where that number came from, because I haven't seen it, uh, if there is such a report. Yeah. I, um, I don't know what was referred to, you, um, what you had heard, but we do track some of that information with our council goal report, the benchmark report. So I'll pull that up and uh, see if that provides Right, because I, I haven't seen a number like that. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Vossipray. Yes, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Well, certainly, um, going from our last uh, city council meeting um, on the uh, 26th, uh, last Wednesday, uh, Jason Parrish did uh, a fabulous job as the chief chef. Is that right, Roberta? Um, directing our employees uh, for the United Way Fiesta Luncheon. And I know that our city manager and our city attorney and other people were slinging the hash, cutting the onions, uh, finding out what those chilies being peeled and smoked uh, do to one's eyes, et cetera, et cetera. But it was really delicious, and it was a great opportunity to raise funds for uh, the United Way. Um, I don't know if there are any more luncheons planned or whatever. Okay. Um, and then on that uh, Wednesday night was the celebration of those people who put on the Wednesday night market, and that was at the Hyatt. And I had mentioned before about um, how people really appreciate the beauty of the Hyatt, and that was many years in coming. Um, but the art and public places um, worked ardently with uh, artists' proposals for the art that did go there. And um, again, I echo my um, concern about continuing that relationship with the Hyatt so that there are more eyes, more visibility, um, more feeling of safety, um, Prince Memorial Greenway. Um, and then, um, let's see, 
Uh, as the Wednesday night market, they celebrated their 24th anniversary, so moving into the 25th. So um, that, that was really quite a gathering. And they certainly have brought an excellent presence, I think, to our downtown area for the Wednesday night market. Um, and then the next, uh, on the morning of the 27th, um, we meet the Russian River Watershed Association, um, meets at nine uh, in the Windsor Town Hall. Um, and the uh, main presentation was from the new director of the um, North Coast Regional Water Quality Control Board. And he did uh, an excellent job. Um, his name, Kent Gilfey, um, uh, uh, no, um, his name is Matt St. John. We then heard a report from Kent Gilfrey from the Sonoma County Water Agency, and I'll pass this around and I'll pick it up at the end um, from Stephanie. This is a water smart development. I'm sure that Councilmember Gorin, as the chair of the Water Advisory Committee, has received this, but this is a document that uh, will soon be going to uh, press that will work with um, developers and uh, consumers uh, as to the importance of water and um, the conservation of water use. Um, certainly there was a, an, it's an ongoing report, uh, an update, and that is the Safe Meds Ordinance. Um, in um, Alameda, there is uh, a new ordinance there that I would love to see modeled here in Santa Rosa. Um, and I will let you know about that as far as the safe meds and how they are disposed of. Um, and our own safe meds, the collection, um, Kaiser takes part. Um, many people here remember Long's drugstores. Uh, Long's is now CVS and their headquarters has said no, they are not going to participate in that safe meds. So we need you out there writing letters, uh, communicating, giving support to the CVS. The local CVS managers want to do that, but they're being told by corporate that they're not going to do that. And I know that there are probably reasons for that, but I still think we need to exercise our democratic voice on that. Um, let's see. Then um, it's already been mentioned about the Green Music Center. A lot of people who came to that um, long weekend of wonderful activities um, centered primarily around music, but also the beautiful architecture, the same architect who did uh, Mr. Ron, who did uh, Tanglewood, the Seiji Ozawa Hall in Tanglewood in Lenox, Mass, Massachusetts, um, was the architect for that beautiful structure. And a lot of the people who came from out of town stayed uh, here locally in Santa Rosa. So again, uh, same as uh, Levi uh, Leipheimer, uh, Grand Fondo, there was a lot of tourism dollars and dining dollars uh, brought in, and I, I know that uh, that's very much appreciated. Um, then yesterday, I, I briefly mentioned the Art and Public Places uh, uh, committee meeting. Um, on a sad note, the uh, many people um, know the highly visible uh, bridge that goes from the Hyatt to Olive Park. That has been vandalized because it's gone into disrepair. And so the Art and Public Places um, discussed uh, what to do about that. I have on my calendar that tomorrow morning is the um, bike and walk um, event at uh, many of our uh, local schools. And then on Monday, October 8th, I have my bi-monthly meeting with my appointees to boards and commissions. Um, and I did want to say about the graffiti ab abatement program, uh, my appointee to the Planning Commission, Caroline Benuelos, um, is from Los Angeles, and she mentioned that um, growing up in LA, they had to paint. She remembers her father out there painting, and then as they grew older, painting every week the fence there. And so it is a, at great cost, and for those people think it's fun to tag, or it's also, you know, um, a, a sign of not only artistic expression, but um, for the turf wars, um, it really does have a very high cost, not only emotional, but um, the, the uh, monetary damages. So thank you, for uh, Mayor, for bringing that report forward to us to learn about the advances that are being made. Thank you. 
Councilmember Gorn. Just very quickly, uh, I think it would be appropriate for us to recognize the efforts, 24 years of efforts of our downtown market and our con community continues to embrace it. So I, I'm hopeful that we can get the organizers in here to recognize their efforts. It's a great asset to our community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you. Uh, Madam City Manager, please. I have one item that I want to call your attention to, and um, many of you probably saw this. In the um, Press Democrat, the Best of Sonoma County Awards were given, and last Thursday um, at the awards banquet, um, our Recreation and Parks Department was honored um, with six different categories of award. And I have to say, leafing through the magazine over the weekend, every other page I turned, there was another Santa Rosa program. So um, the city is very proud. Um, we have recognition of best park, Haworth Park, best playground at Haworth Park, best dog park at Rincon Valley Community Park, best swimming spot at Finley Aquatic Center, best bike trail at Prince Memorial Greenway, and best summer camp at Camp Watam and um, Watam, thank you. And uh, I have not attended the camp, so uh, yeah, <laughs> good, great. And I'm, I'm sure she would probably have accolades for the camp as well. So um, we want to really recognize our uh, staff for the efforts that they go, but to thank the community, I think this is a representation of the value that people in our community place on these um, community assets. And so um, congratulations to all and thank the community very much for making that recognition. Thank you, City Attorney. Nothing to report, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, we'll move on to our uh, consent calendar, please. Our first item on the consent calendar is 11.1, .1, a motion for contract extension investment advisory services. 11.2 is a resolution, Proposition 1B, Public Transportation Modernization Improvement and Service Enhancement Act, uh, grant submittal for automated vehicle locator system. Item 11.3 is a resolution, um, ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act, um, improvements to transit mall bathrooms. And item 11.4 is a resolution naming the Finley Complex Senior Wing Edition and interior rooms uh, for the family who have been prominent donors for this as the person senior wing. Thank you. Council questions? We have none. We have uh, no comment cards on this item. So, Mr. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to move consent items 11.1 .1 through 11.4 and wait for the reading. We have five ayes. Councilmember Bartley and ours are absent this evening. Thank you. We'll move on to 12.1. Uh, um, our report item this evening is found at 12.1, and this concerns a settlement agreement with Pacific Gas and Electric for under collection of utility users tax. And Manny Silviero from our finance department will present that item. Good afternoon, Mayor Olivares and members of the City Council. My name is Manny Silverio, Revenue Operations Supervisor, Finance Department. Uh, the item before you this afternoon is to request approval of a settlement agreement with PG&E Company regarding an under collection of our 5% utility user stocks. In January 2011, PG&E sent us a notice that they are implementing a new GIS system to better identify customer taxing jurisdictions within their service area. As part of their review, they identified premises whose current taxing jurisdictions they believed were incorrect and requested a city to, for assistance to verify. They provided us with three files that contained Premise addresses. The first file contained 73,809 accounts currently coded as within the city limits. 
Second file represented PG&E's proposed changes after comparing its billing system to their GIS maps. They identified 712 accounts going from being coded as inside the city limits to outside and, um, and 621 accounts that should have been coded as inside but are currently coded as outside. The third file contained 210 accounts um, that as a result of their review, they were not very sure if um, they were correct or not, so pg and &E had a lower degree of confidence in this group. So they requested the city to review for accuracy. With the assistance of Muni Services, our revenue consultant, the accuracy of 660 accounts total was reviewed by city staff. After reviewing additional long longitude and latitude data from PG&E, city and PG&E staff performed additional reviews, focusing particularly on accounts with incomplete premise addresses. Um, corrections were forwarded to PG&E to make the appropriate changes prior to their notifications being sent out in November of 2011. PG&E reported in December 2011 that after incorporating the results of our review and reconciling our results against the results of surrounding jurisdictions, they finalized the population of reassignments necessary within their billing system, resulting in the following for Santa Rosa. 409 account, 491 accounts are going from inside the city to outside and 570 accounts going from outside city to inside. PG&E acknowledged since the beginning that their GIS upgrade could impact utility users' tax paid to the city and on future remittances. They brought forward a settlement offer in the amount of 145,480 cents. This represented the under collection of UUT from 653 customers that were actually within the city limits but were coded as outside in their billing system based on a one year estimate using the average of 07, 08, and 09 revenue figures. They did not take into consideration annexation dates, exemptions of any account from UUT like PG&E care customers, PG&E accounts, city, county, state, and federal accounts, annual prepayers, et cetera, open and close dates, and our $1,000 maximum tax. As an alternative to this settlement offer, we requested PG&E to advise what the financial implications would be if the city requested PG&E to back bill their customers for a three-year period. The estimated UUT revenue would be 123089 assuming 100% um, collection. This estimate was based on 080910 build revenue data from PG&E and factored in annexation dates, exemptions, open close dates, and the $1,000 max. The three-year back billing of 653 customers will result in a potential UUT revenue that would be 22,391 less than the settlement offer. PG&E originally estimated that they overcollected 77,636 in UUT for a period of one year from 742 accounts that they have coded as inside the city limits but should really be outside. This estimate did not take into consideration any of the factors previously mentioned. They offered to process the refunds in the form of a credit on behalf of the city and to take a one-time reduction in their next UUT monthly remittance in the same amount. The Finance Department authorized PG&E to move forward and update the accounts and process a one-year refund as authorized by city code, since this was the most cost-effective way to remedy the situation. PG&E reported in December of 2011 that the total amount actually refunded was only 56,635 to 491 accounts, which was $21,000 less than their original estimate of 77,636 to 742 accounts. They also reassigned 570 accounts from outside city limits to inside city limits compared to their original estimate of 653. Note that the exhibit in my staff report is PG&E's original calculation of the estimated UUT over collection and under collection. It also shows an estimated net impact on future monthly remittances. These estimates did not take into consideration any of the factors previously mentioned. 
It is recommended by the Finance Department that the Council, by resolution, approve the settlement agreement with PG&E regarding the under-collection of UUT by PG&E and authorize the City Manager to execute the agreement. I'm available for questions. Representatives from PG&E are also present this afternoon. Should you have any specific questions you would like to direct to them? Thank you, Manny. Council questions? Councilmember Russell. Well, I would like to hear from uh, the people who are here representing. Yeah, do you have a specific people. question for them? Not a question, just to hear well, what Well, I think response. I'd rather limit it to questions if we could. I mean, the presentation has been made. Do you have a question for them? Well, I'll help out. Yes, I have ahead. a question if you want to take a minute. Uh, thank you, Manny, for the presentation. Looking at your findings, though, it, it struck me, uh, doing the math here, we have 660 premises addresses reviewed, yet we have adjustments of over 1,000. We have. If you, if you go back, if you can, you've got 491 premises, address going from inside to outside, 570 going from outside to inside. Mm -hmm. So we have more adjustments than what were reviewed. Well, because in their initial um, data that they sent us, they already have some accounts that already are being planned to be changed. Okay, so that's... So, yes, so, these are just what we discovered as we don't like what we're seeing. So they're not necessarily connected? No. Okay, of those 660 that we reviewed, how many adjustments were there? Do you have any idea? Uh, sorry, I didn't get into that. Yeah, I just, it just struck yeah. me because that, the adjustments are higher than what we reviewed, mm -hmm. but okay, thank you. Other questions? I, I have one card from Colleen Fernald. Good afternoon, Colleen Fernald from Sebastopol. In Sebastopol, we have the EMF safety network, and key executives from PG&E were caught spying, and they were subsequently left PG&E. So as you go about working to get support for community choice aggregate, I'd like this to be one more example, when people give you a hard time on municipalities being able to manage utilities. Um, you've seen the reports about scientists uh, having not a lot of accuracy in their work, depending on who they pay for it. Well, let's talk about smart meters and the impacts of health. So I don't trust them with accuracy. I don't trust them with accepting accountability for safety when they do harm, let alone billing problems. And I'm not sure all the blame is to be with them in this particular case. But I do have a problem with their integrity. So I hope that you will gather all your strength when it comes to delivering safe, clean, affordable, carbon-free, if possible, energy for your ratepayers, and that we can shift some of this lack of responsibility away from a corporate interest that puts shareholders in front of ratepayers. So all of you will be much more accountable than those board of directors or executives that think that they can kill people, that they can poison people, and they can continue to harm with technology at great risk while they lobby and they don't practice the precautionary principle. That's what you can do because you're representing your citizens, not just shareholders. So may the force be with you all. Thank you, Colleen. Who's here from PG&E? Uh, you, you don't need to get up. I just want to acknowledge you. Thank, thank you for being here. I just want to say I want to thank you and staff for working together to find a resolution for this. I greatly appreciate it. And I don't know if there's anything that you want to add to what's already been presented. If you do, uh, come on up. Only briefly. Um, I want to thank you. My name is Joe Horrock. I'm with PG&E. I want to thank Manny and his team and the whole finance department for working with us on this. I know this is not easy. We're moving to a new technology where we'll be uh, better able to take into consideration the changes that go on within a, within a city and be accurate about this. But I want to thank Manny and his team for helping us out and, and getting this as, as correct as we could. So thank you very much. Thank you. I appreciate your, your work. Quick question for you, if you don't mind, sir. Uh, I note in the report that p you didn't take into consideration or your team didn't take into consideration the maximum amount of uh, $1,000 per utility user. Is there a reason why? 
Well, when we made that estimate, we realized that this change that we, we had gone in, and, and before we had, this had been a manual process, when someone had called us and said they were in the city, we would go ahead and put them into the UUT. When we were going through this process, we realized that this was an issue that we wanted to make good with the city on to make sure that we were doing it. So when we were making that estimate, we went ahead and took those estimates over the last three years out of it and said um, we couldn't make determinations about who had paid uh, over $1,000, what the care programs were, things of that nature. We went back and said, this is the amount that was billed. We understand that, that um, this was an error on our side, so we just wanted to make it as, as uh, good as possible as we could. I, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure I quite follow that. So when you're doing your analysis, you couldn't tell if it was 1,000, if someone had exceeded the $1,000 maximum? Well, a lot of that we just report into the city. We don't, um, well, a lot of times if there's a thousand dollar maximum, it's, it's uh, we're just providing a collection agency for the city for these things. So when it comes to care, uh, we, we, we can pull those out, what's exempt um, or a or thousand dollar for uh, an ordinance, that's something that, the, that the, the city finance department handles. Is that something that pg e wasn't aware of or were you aware of that thousand dollar maximum? Uh, that is something that I believe in Manny, this is something that the, the city ordinance uh, would call out and so we'd take direction on that. Okay, so you weren't aware of it at that time, but you are now, or is that a- But $1,000 yeah. maximum? Right. Well, every ordinance we deal with is a little different. Sure. There's one in Sebastopol, sure. there's a Fairfax, other one, so we, we are just the collection agent on it. We're not necessarily going and making different rules for different- uh, Which for you different want to be ones. accurate. We That's want to be of accurate course. as we can. We want to be accurate as we can. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Gordon, you have this item? I do. I move resolution of the Council of the City of Santa Rosa to approve a settlement agreement with Pacific Gas and Electric Company for under collected utility users tax and waive further reading of the text. Second. We have five ayes. Councilmember Bartley and ours are absent this evening. Thank you, Manny. Okay, we move on to uh, public comment. Colleen Fernald. This is an announcement for the Mermaid Festival that's coming up on the um, 28th of October in Rio Nido. It's where we'll be continuing the Pollution Prevention Puppet Show. And I had the good fortune of sharing that with the Russian River Watershed Association when um, Council Member Boss Dupre was there and Patricia, uh, I mean, um, Virginia Porter um, suggested that they would look into seeing how they can support it. Uh, I would really like Council Member Voss to pray to go to the last meeting of the Russian River Watershed Association and be sure to vote for a new chairperson. Particularly, I'd like to see someone who is really dedicated to the watershed because the municipalities have more than their share of entities looking out for their interest, but the mission is to take care of the watershed, and I see that there are uh, a lot of ways that that can be improved. I'm sorry I missed your proclamation on October being the recognition of Domestic Violence Month. As you know, my ex-husband raped me in the month of October three years ago. I came to you for support because not only did he rape me, he was involved in teen prostitution, pornography, and illegal drugs. I asked your police department to get a search warrant to look in the safe. There had been a witness to the illegal drugs. None of this was done. And instead, the opposite of what should have been done was done. Now. Let's talk about striking first, whether it's Efren Carrillo, whether it's the U.S. military, whether it is my ex-husband. Who has the right to use self-defense? 
I was denied that by your police department. And my daughter was put in the hands of this criminal where she was able to get into his legal drugs, which were in her system when they found her hanging from a tree in Annandale Park. So your chief and his people in charge went out there for the photo op, another proclamation, what's been done in the past year to make a difference in the broken parts of the system. They refused to meet with me. New things have occurred since the last time I tried to get them to meet with me. I want to fix the broken parts of the system that allowed my daughter to die. I'm not here with a team of lawyers to sue your pants off. I just asked for a meeting so that we could talk about this, you, the chief, and I've been denied. Mayor, what are you going to do different this year? You still have a criminal loose. There will be no peace in my life without justice. I want your assistance in getting justice. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Thank you, Colleen. That concludes our meeting. Students, where are you, where are you from? Who's, who's the spokesperson out there? You don't know where you're from? Santa Rosa High School, all right. Santa Rosa High School is in the house tonight, uh, taking a lot of notes and probably preparing a report. Welcome to the city council meeting. It was a short meeting this, this evening. Uh, we are getting ready to adjourn, so it's time to get out there into the hot sun and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Our meeting is adjourned.